In this episode, you're going to learn why service design needs to become a more inclusive practice and how you can benefit from that. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, this is Karen Baker, and you're tuned into the Service Design Show, episode 160. Hi, my name is Mark Fontaine, and welcome back to a brand new episode of the Service Design Show. On this show, we explore what's beneath the surface of service design. What are those hidden and invisible things that make a difference between success and failure, all to help you design great services that have a positive impact on people, business, and our planet. Our guest in this episode is Karen Baker. Karen is the founder and president of Boathouse Inc.'s Washington DC office. She's pursuing a doctor of design at the North Carolina State University. And Karen was also the host and producer of a live weekly radio show on the intersection between business and design. The reason I'm excited to have Karen on the show today is that we're going to discuss where the recent raised awareness for designing for inclusivity is coming from and what is driving it forward. We're also going to discuss how a more inclusive service design practice is going to help you design services that are better for our communities and for your business. And also at the same time, how that is going to help you to get a seat at the table where the important decisions are made. Karen shares some very practical and inspiring examples around this topic, ranging from an inclusive marathon in the metaverse to how Lego helped the LGBTQ community to design their own vocabulary. Sometimes it can be challenging to translate topics like this into your own daily practice, but I can assure you that if you stick around till the end of this episode, you'll walk away with one simple but very powerful question that has the potential to transform how you look at your own work from now on. If you want to keep growing as a service design professional and enjoy conversations like this, make sure you subscribe to the channel and click that bell icon because we bring a new episode every week or so. That about wraps it up for the introduction. So now it's time to sit back, relax, and enjoy the conversation with Karen Baker. Welcome to the show, Karen. Thank you, Mark, for having me. I'm excited to be here. I, I am as well. We're going to talk about an important topic, uh, which uh, I think we should be addressing more often in the community. And we are. We recently had a, a episode on radical participatory design. I think this closely oh, uh, yeah. relates to, to that. Um, but yeah. before we jump into that, as always, uh, I invite the guests on the show to give a brief introduction about who they are so that we have some context. So Karen, please enlighten us. Sure. Again, thank you for having me, Mark. Um, I'm Karen Baker, and I'm founder and president of a company called Boathouse Group, Inc. Uh, it's a 22-year-old marketing and AI tech firm that has been based in Boston. And I've been charged with opening a DC office, which I've done, and really excited to be able to bring the skills that I have. My background is in design thinking, design research, human-centered design, and that is what I'm very passionate about and have been. I've used it a lot in business, um, which has been a place that design thinking has not always held. It's been very tech and education based. So it's been really exciting to see the outcomes. Uh, you know, I do a lot of work in social impact here at Boathouse. So, yeah, yeah really, you know, has been a, a great journey in mm. the last year. Mm. And you, uh, you also told me you had a podcast or radio career. One day? Yeah. What's that after about? 10 years, I had a uh, live radio show. It was every Friday at 11 o'clock, and it was based on design thinking and business. I would bring people together uh, who were in the industry who normally didn't get the, a platform, you know, to talk about their work, their innovations, their products, the type of impact they were making in community. So we were live every Friday on a radio station here in Washington, D.C., and yeah, it, it was a joy. It really was. I met amazing people over like 300 and something shows. So. Oh. Awesome. 300. Uh, I, I have a long way to go to get there. And, uh, <laughs> uh, the, the great thing is you already have that radio voice. So this is going to be an awesome uh, conversation for the people who are listening to the podcast edition. Thanks, Mark. 
Garen, uh, I didn't prepare you for this. I don't prepare anyone uh, for the lightning round, but we do have a question, uh, Firesada lightning round. I've got five questions for you. Uh, okay. your, your goal is to answer them as quickly and as briefly as possible. Just the first thing that comes to your mind. Are you ready? Perfect. I'm ready. Okay, let's do this. Uh, if you could work from anywhere in the world, which place would it be? Oh, that's a great question. It would be Dominican Republic. Hmm. What's always in your fridge? Bread. All right. Uh, which book or books are you reading at this moment, if any? Oh, that's a good one. I think it's none. <laughs> <laughs> I think that I think that's the first. Uh, okay, yeah. awesome. <laughs> uh, next question is: uh, What did I have? Yes. Uh, what was your very very first job? Oh, my very first job was at an NGO that focused on homelessness, community development, and economic development. Mm. And uh, last but not least, do you recall the moment you sort of first heard about the term service design? Oh, yeah. The first moment I heard was at uh, SCAD, Savannah Community uh, College of Art and Design. Uh, when I was in a design management program, we were paired up with service design students. And that's when I began to learn about service design. Mm. Yeah. SCAD mm. has been an, uh, a, a re re respectable and reputable uh, uh, sort of... Uh, uh, Factory isn't the right word, but at least uh, uh, a place where a lot of service design professionals from the U.S. Uh, yeah. emerge from. Not the only Very place, true. definitely, but uh, yeah, yeah, we know a lot of people yeah. from SCAD. Yeah, um, nice. Thank you for the for the lightning round, uh, Karen. Uh, Those are great questions. <laughs> <laughs> I have a bunch more. We could do another twenty if you want. Um, All right. <laughs> let's uh, let's dive into the topic of today. Um, you shared with me that you'd like to discuss design for inclusivity, uh, inclusive design, um, and that's what we're going to do. I'd love to know, first of all, what does the topic mean for you? Because it means probably a lot of different things to many people. What does design for inclusivity mean for you? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that is also a great question because it does mean many things to people. Um, I think the first thing is I've all, initially when I started looking at it, uh, design exclusivity, inclusivity for design or designers, I looked at designers being at the table. What I realized when I really, I, I would say, start to say I was a designer was the designers weren't at the table and it was always kind of fighting for their place to be included within that corporate structure, particularly from a strategic standpoint. They were always thought as the end user, you know, like we come to them when we've thought everything through and we just need them to give maybe some input, but make it look great. So it means that for me, I think that was my initial introduction into it and fighting on that end. But what has broadened for me, and I think it's been the work of uh, you know, being more social impact, you know, being more concerned about marginalized and underrepresented communities and how design impacts them. That's where it's come into me to greaten or heighten the ability to use design in that way. I, I do believe that design can can change a whole lot. You know, I, I truly believe that. So I, I'm also on two rides, I would say, the one to make sure designers are at the table, but then when they're at the table, understanding the knowledge that they need to bring, you know, and the power I think that they hold to be able to impact communities that are, are not getting what they need when products and services are delivered to them. Mm -hmm. Both are definitely interesting avenues to explore. Um, I'm curious, if you look back on your journey, how did you arrive at this topic? Like, when did it become yeah. relevant uh, for you? Like, how can you take us through that, your journey? Yeah, that's, you know, I, I believe that it became most probably at school. Let me say this. Um, when I was doing the Masters um, of Design Thinking at SCAD, it really opened up um, for me a side that was already that is activism, advocacy side of who I was that I hadn't had the opportunity to do as much work in prior to coming into this space academically. And it, it just heightened that. It, it, it almost brought, you know, an awareness to me that this was always there. And so I then dedicated my work um, at the time I was owning my own company that I would only take on clients that were impacting community, that their work was set out to do that. 
and that I would use design in that way. But the initial of it really was thinking from a marketing standpoint. You know, how do we deliver the best aesthetically? You know, how do we make sure people are invited in and want to use what we have to offer? That was really the initials of, of, of how I saw design. It was really the academic education that brought me to a place that I was like, okay, this is bigger than what I know. You know, design could do so much more than what I know. And I started to embrace it. Um, so, yeah, and, and, and it really took a teacher, too, as well, to say, you know, what's your background? And I was like, yeah, I initially I went to Howard University and I got a degree in political science. He was like, makes total sense. I was like, does it? Because <laughs> I had not used it in for such a long time. But he was like, yeah, this is showing up for you. So it took someone to reintroduce me, you know, and see something that I hadn't seen for me to really start to take that journey. I'm really curious to learn more about it. So the political science, how, how did, what was the connection? How did they explain it? He explained it as, you know, we had an exercise where we were in the process of, uh, one, delivering our portfolio of what we had learned during school. But I also, we had an exercise where we were taking a tire and redesigning the way that a tire would be used when people are in rain. And the, the way that what I delivered was, I guess, different from anybody else. And he said that the, the way I was thinking about research, I was thinking about it from the way that it was impacting the person more than it was impacting the outcome of the whole. And he saw that being the connection. It really took me some time, Mark, to really sit down and say, wow, this whole structure politically, this, you know, how it impacts someone, the laws and regulations and things like that, which I use in this tire design, you know, uh, as well, too. So I, I, you know, that's the way that he explained it to me. Yeah, hmm. It was interesting. Hmm. Very. I, I think it's awesome to see that people from many backgrounds and disciplines entering yeah. into the design space, the design field. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think it's so uh, two things. One, it's limiting to think about the designer because, uh, in a traditional sense, it's it's very um, it, it's sort of a privileged thing to be that designer. While uh, any true. anybody can contribute to a design practice in a design space, uh, and I yeah. already forgot what the other thing is <laughs> I had on my <laughs> mind. <laughs> but yeah, coming back coming in uh, into the design space from uh, different backgrounds is I think really really helpful. Um, yeah. One uh, question related to this is you sort of got into uh, interested in design for inclusivity, inclusive design. I'm th where do you see that it's currently lacking? So what are what are some what do you see around you where you think, well, uh, it would, would have been awesome if this was designed from a more inclusive perspective? Yeah, I think that uh, it really goes back to designers being at the, the table in the very beginning. So it also goes at what you just said before about people coming from many spaces and places um, as designers. And and when they do come to the table, and particularly when you have a diverse table, and that, that means many, many things. That, that's gender, that's age, that's culture, that's experience, life experiences. There's just a stream of ideas that can be bought. To, to the table. You know, when I first, um, again, started to recognize designers not being at the table, and even where I am at Boathouse, a lot of times the designers are usually on the end. We go in strategically, we do all the research, we then, you know, give them a brief, then they walk away. And I was like, this is a bit of a gap, you know, that's happening. And so, you know, I started to bring them to the conversation in the very beginning. This is what we're, they're sitting in on the strategy. They're, they're understanding what the, they're at every phase of what is going on. And that has helped in the project that we're working on now, which is about a marginalized, underinsured community in healthcare. And how do we change the trajectory of what is happening to them? Because otherwise the design team, creative team, they were struggling because they didn't have that connection to why we came up with what we came up with. So we began to lose the narrative because we became very ad focused. You know, we came very much, let's look at the, have it look this way instead of does it actually accomplish what we're trying to do? We're trying to shift behavior, which I believe design can do. We're trying to make sure that people see this in a better light, that they're able to talk about the disease that they're actually impacted by. Those are the things that I believe can be lacking from the beginning at sitting at the table, having them part of every piece of strategy research that you do, then letting them start to deliver.
Mm. So that's that's one thing, and I think uh, a lot of people who are listening right now will recognize this, and they would want to be part of more uh, earlier mm -hmm. conversations. Um, yeah. So uh, in, being included uh, from that sense, mm -hmm. um, uh, but you also mentioned the other uh, aspect, like um, mm -hmm. not including the communities, uh, not including the end users. Mm -hmm. Something you can say about that? Where where do you see that lacking? Yeah, for sure. I think sometimes people are designing so fast um, that they for, they forget and sometimes purposely to include the community that they're going to be serving. So part of the design justice practice that I've started to use probably in the last eight months is that you include that community in the conversation before you design. You, you, you talk to them, you ask them questions, then you go back. You know, I've had people say to me, do we have time to do that? You know, that's going to slow us down. Well, if we don't, it's not going to be for them anymore. It's going to be for us. So that is the part that has to happen. And you have to prepare for that. And that in your time, you have to prepare for that. And if you think of that very much in the very beginning, then you'll have the time to do so. But people start design, they start research, they start strategizing, and then they go, did you talk to anybody who is going to actually, you know, be the end user of this? And they go, no, we didn't have time to do that. Or that's not what we do, you know, and that is the problem. Mm. That's the problem. Mm. Yeah. Why do you feel, uh, at least I feel that this topic has become more, uh, has come onto the agenda in the recent years. Like it's more, it's becoming more important. Um, I'm curious if you are also seeing the same that it's being more addressed now. Now, and if yeah. so, I'm curious, why? What is your theory on why now? Like, was it? I, I would say the problem was even bigger, maybe five or ten years ago. So, why Very now? True. What's your take on that? Very true, and that's a, that. That is a, a really good thing to talk about. I think you know, and and I I attribute it to, and I agree with you because it was a problem before. I mean, it, it just even the term design inclusive or inclusive design, you weren't hearing that, you know, at all. You weren't hearing that terminology. I think the disruption of COVID and the disparities that took place during COVID, regardless of people, where people were, regardless of you talk about black and brown communities, indigenous communities, that it the light was shined on it, you know, so that it pushed it apart around globally. You know, even though I'm in the United States, of course, we heard it, but you heard it globally. You heard that this isn't just where you are. This is where everyone is. You know, everyone's facing a little piece of this, some people greater than others. And then I think the conversation started to pick up more. I started to read about it more. You know, I started to see more commercial magazines or, or articles or, you know, radio or whatever media, period. Let me say that. Start to have more conversation about what was taking place and how we as a community could be impacting it. Because I do agree that this didn't start in 2020. Um, and you can have conversations with other designers who, you know, again, 2015, 2014, they were thinking in this way, you know, even for myself, it was 2011, um, 2011 that I was thinking about things like this. So yeah, you're absolutely right. Absolutely. But I think the pandemic heightened it. Yeah. And in the United States for us, Black Lives Matter made it even more. Mm, yeah. yeah. Uh, as as yeah. it goes, never waste a good crisis. Uh, <laughs> that, that's a great quote. <laughs> well, yeah. I hope that we need less crises to actually get yeah. smarter from these things. But when we do yeah. have one, let, let at least make the most use out of it. Yeah, um, I agree. You had, uh, I think, a few very interesting examples where mm -hmm. it sort of shows what can happen when uh, uh, you do design from a more inclusive uh, mindset and inclusive perspective. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can uh, just go over some of uh, these stories yeah. and illustrate and, and hear uh, what you find inspiring uh, about them. So do you have a story to share with us? Yeah, one was, and it's interesting because an intern at Boathouse brought this story to me and I had not, I didn't know it was happening. And it's interesting because we were having a conversation because when I was talking about design um, inclusive uh, or inclusivity in the metaverse, she was asking, they were asking me, is, you know, we had like 50 interns and she was, they were asking me, you know, what was next and, you know, in, in advertising and marketing. And I'm like the metaverse, you know, we have to start paying attention to that. 
And her and I met one on one. And she was like, you know, when you first said that I was being so against the metaverse and so against learning about it. And she said, so I went and checked it out and she found this article on degree deodorant company. They had done this marathon in the metaverse for people living with disabilities. And it gave them the opportunity to be part of a marathon, whether they wanted to uh, change their disability within the um, metaverse or keep their disability within the metaverse. And some chose both sides. And how that was just a celebration of showing inclusivity, accessibility, you know, and how design can do that you know, from that and how the metaverse was going to be more pointed and and more direct and ensuring that it did a better job of inclusivity um, in the metaverse. It was really exciting to see it. You know, I was really excited to see it had really large participation as well. And again, if you're not in that community, you wouldn't have known it had occurred, you know, and I'm not in that community. So I didn't know someone had to bring it to me, but I thought that was just a great story that had occurred. And for a deodorant company <laughs> to do that, kudos to them. So uh, I I didn't know about this example either. And mm-hmm. there are, I have so many blind spots and, and things to learn about. Um, what do you feel is in this example, the thing that inspires you the most? Yeah, I think it, it what inspires me the most is, it, it. for me, it feels like good design, but it also, allows a community to be in a place where they feel that there's a safe space and a place of like, only words I can think of acceptance. Like I'm seeing you for who you are, you know, and if design is able to put you in a place where you feel that you're not excluded, that is what was, was good for me, you know? And even to me, it it also pushed the, um, the thought process, you know, of even going to not do it a marathon where it was able body people to be in the marathon. They could have easily done that, you know, and had an, a marathon in the metaverse just for able body and not even thought about the fact of how people living with um, a disability could actually take part. But they said only people living with a disability are going to take part in that. And I think for that, that is the extra step. Super interesting. Uh, it is. Well, very. yeah, we'll, we'll make sure to add a link in the show notes to, uh, to this example. Yeah. Any other things that you find inspiring or interesting related to this topic? Yeah, you know, that's been, it's interesting because it goes back to your question a little bit about the design inclusive and, you know, how, it, you know, five years ago this was happening. You know, I think that what we're seeing also, the I've spent a lot of time talking about writing about the metaverse. So a lot of things are happening and showing up that are, I won't say behind closed doors, but if you're not in the space, you're not knowing that it's actually taking place. And one thing that's actually happening too is um, Meta, which is, people know it's Facebook, but it's now Meta. They have created an immersive learning lab and they are taking in applications now to be able to do better than what they did, I think it's Facebook to ensure that um, we have more diverse designers and creators in technology, not only metaverse, but also web 3.0. So they are putting out a hundred million dollars to train uh, more designers and creators in this space. And that is their pledge to do that. So I think that that's, that again is very exciting because if we know anything about the history of Facebook, particularly during the last couple of years, they have not done well, I will say failed. Um, so this is their thing to try to re, you know, invite, invent themselves and put themselves in a better light in how they've been doing before. So I'm really excited and following it very close to see what they do and that they deliver what they say they're going to deliver. So, hmm. yeah. Hmm. yeah. Have you, um, related to these examples, do you see uh, a pattern emerging um in in these communities that are thinking about uh, inclusive design, like what are some uh, maybe guiding principles that you see emerging from the conversations that are happening? That's a good question. I think the the most um, guidance that I'm seeing is coming from the design justice network, which is that practice that was started to be created in 2015, and they sped it up in 2020 based on what we just talked about previously. And they created principles and the principles were, were created out of a media center. 
And they all, you know, spent a lot of time creating these principles and how these principles should be grounded in impacting marginalized and underrepresented communities, a big focus on black, brown and indigenous communities. And they have been, I mean, diligent. They have been diligent. One person asked me, do you think that they they'll be the watchdog? Um, I think with manpower, they could be the watchdog because the principles are simple. They're not complicated. They're not anything that even outside of the design community that could be be followed. They could be followed in media and marketing and advertising and anything branding. It, they could be followed in that way. But I think that they have a due diligence right now. They are very charged with ensuring that they're paying attention to what is going on and trying to make sure that they insert their voice in the conversation and change some of how people practice. They're even beginning to do pedagogy. So uh, they recently did a summit at MIT to uh, start to bring social justice into design in higher education. And that's awesome. And again, uh, there have been already a few mentions of that here on the Service Design Show, which is only mm -hmm. good because I hope platforms like this help to spread the message, create awareness. And, um, you know, sometimes uh, an episode resonates with one person and then the next episode resonates with somebody else. So sometimes mm -hmm. repeating these and uh, these messages is is quite important. Uh, so thank you for bringing that up again. And uh, I think we'll we'll also be able to link to design justice. I think it's G design justice something that, that they have a different name, right? Yeah. yeah, they say design justice. Is it member network? But uh, yeah, the design justice network. Yeah. Uh, well, we'll uh, we'll look that up. Um, any other examples that you've seen uh, that do a good job from your perspective on this? Oh, yeah, there are a couple more. Um, actually, Lego is another one as well, too. Lego last year, and maybe the year before, but I think last year was a big, big impact. Lego did something called A to Z Awesome, uh, in which they um, allowed the LBGTQ community to design their own vocabulary and terminology using Lego, which was really interesting. Uh, so they could come in and, and I think it's still, you know, it, it, it occurred in June uh, during Pride Month and they started it then, but I don't think it's over. Um, but they allowed them to really come in and, and bring the terminology that was necessary that they wanted people to be able to recognize in regards to them as a community. I thought that that was a really great way to use something like Lego, you know, in doing so, you know. Um, I think that they're just another a company that continues to push the envelope uh, and uh, continues to uh, hold true to what their corporate social responsibility is and how they continue to design. And, and then that was one that came up in June that I was like, this is really exciting to see. Again, purposefully with meaning, you know, going to a community and making sure that they feel inclusive. Great, very practical, uh, tangible mm -hmm. examples. Um, and it's it's great that these companies sort of put themselves forward as, uh, as a beacon uh, of light mm -hmm. and so hopefully sort of showing the way forward. What have you seen, you work with a lot of clients uh, and stakeholders. Um, when you try to put this topic forward, what kind of response, what is the common response you get? Um, because I can imagine that this isn't something that people think daily about. So when you try to address this, what do people say? That's, that's you know, that that's another great question because it's interesting. I think now I, there's more of an openness to it, right? And because um, I'm very purposeful about going after people who are kind of already doing the work, but they may need um, uh, guidance or even a little more structure in how they strategically go about impacting the communities that they have decided to serve, their mission, purpose, you know, corporate res social responsibility, whichever it is. Um, they are more open to it. Um, so we actually took on American Diabetes Association and that was their charge. What we were able to do is really narrow down exactly what was happening. Really did dug deep research wise. We spent like two and a half months in research before we even started with them, um, which, you know, they had to be open to that. Again, it goes back to how long is this going to take, you know, type of thing. And they were very open to that because what we brought, brought to the table, they were 
you know, blown away by because it was some things that had been done, some things that hadn't been done. Um, the response that we got from doing focus groups, talking to community, talking to scientists, they just, you know, sometimes it, I think sometimes organizations in, in with their credit, having the time to do that when you're constantly moving, trying to serve members and community, you the time to pause and actually figure out why is this not happening? Why are we higher in rate than we need to be? Just doesn't, no one pauses. So we had the time to pause for them. And so when we brought it to them, they were excited, Mark. They were just re- literally on the call when we presented it, people were shedding tears um, because they were like, we are finally going to be able to really make the impact that we plan to make through this particular campaign and program. Any, um, if you reflect on this, any ideas, what made them responsive to your proposal uh, to approach it in this way? Yeah, that's that's a good question. I think we had the opportunity to pitch, and I'll say this, because you know, with, with us being so virtual lately, people take in RFPs and then they don't get the time to actually talk to anyone to say, Maybe what you put on paper versus what we actually get a chance to talk to you about, we really get a chance to know who you are and understand fully how you're going to deliver this. And I'll be honest, again, talking about business world, people don't always bring design thinking into a proposal. And I brought that into that proposal um, and how we were going to deliver strategy from a different light. That was of interest to them. You know, um, they didn't know the practice completely in that way. They didn't know the methodology. So that was exciting to actually deliver this program in a different way or in a way that may have brought a different results than what is traditionally bought in marketing in particular. Speaking of uh, different things and maybe things that surprise uh, people, I'm curious if if you look at the design uh, inclusivity movement network, what is the thing that is maybe surprising you of what you're seeing? Well, I'm going to be honest with you. I was surprised by the design justice. <laughs> I was really surprised by it. And I learned about it through an article that a woman wrote, and she was writing it on the metaverse very early part of this year. And I was like, design justice. I was like, this is such a great combination of terms. But I was surprised by it, you know, um, that people were actually going to allow social justice and design to actually come together and push this as a practice. I I was surprised by it. Um, I think I'm sometimes still surprised by the, um, I was surprised by the World Economic Forum meeting very early to create governance and guidance and regulation around the metaverse. We didn't do that with social media. So I was very surprised to see that they actually were gonna say, we're gonna sit down and look at this from an inclusive standpoint and how you all begin to design this space so we don't have the level of disruption that we had in social media. So those right now are, that's why they're very much on my radar. I'm very much paying attention to them because that those things surprise me for Mm. sure. And uh, again, a a nice leeway into uh, a next question that I had, as you mentioned, uh, governance uh, around the metaverse to ensure that we don't do as much damage as we did previously. Um, right. the, what is the thing that you feel could accelerate the adoption of this uh, mindset and practice and philosophy? Is it mm. things like governance, which uh, mm. I wouldn't say per se uh, speed up adoption, but maybe mm-hmm. they do. I'm curious how you feel about this. Yeah, I don't know that governance will either. We're in agreement with that. I, I don't know that that will do that. Um, I, I really would have loved to be a fly on the wall in that conversation that was had because it was very big brands there like Sony and Lego and Microsoft and Meta and Walmart. And I was like, was anybody small there, you know, that actually could speak to how this is going to really impact? So. Yeah, I don't know that governance is it either. Um, You know, I I think that there's going to be a lot of watching and seeing, you know, um, on on how we do this. But I think that's another thing of designers being at the table, you know, you know, to 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 really help with how you govern really communities being at the table saying this is what is we're seeing when we're taking part in it right now. 
And these are the things that we're um, concerned about. Uh, these are the things that we think may be disruptive. These are the things that we may see go the same way in which we've seen in past in technology and innovation as it has occurred as well, too. So there, there has to be this step back. Um, and some may view it as a step down to you and I to just have a conversation with you and I. But it really is. That's inclusivity, too. You mentioned there were just uh, the sort of the big players in the room. And yeah. um, I, I'm really curious about, like, you're open to this. And I'm sure that if somebody from your uh, company brings in an idea that is related to this, you'll there will be a war, uh, sort of welcomed with open arms. But what would you maybe if you could give uh, some advice to people who also feel strongly motivated to put this on the agenda within their company, but maybe like senior management isn't yet as uh, aware of re responsive to these topics, like any, any guidance um, that could help here? Yeah. I mean, your, your question is timely because it's interesting. I just had an article come out well, yesterday, I guess you're saying, I will say no, in September uh, through Harvard Business Review to talk about exactly that question you just posed to me. And so I went through steps for people from a managerial uh, leadership perspective and what they could do, particularly when you come from as a designer and you walk into that space and you say, this is what I want to do. Um, I think the big thing is it's an openness. You have to have an openness to want to make sure that you kind of evaluate what is going on internally? And, and do you have a design team, whether it's service design, design thinking, uh, creative graphic, that it's sitting there and they're always in designing in a silos? You know, they're not part of the conversation that you're having. And are you going to welcome them in, you know, in that way? So one of the first things I said in the article is diversity at the table. And it, like I said, it's many lights that are shed on that. And you're going to have to, and as a leadership st standpoint, look around your table and see who's at your table, you know, and are you being inclusive? Is there equity at your table? All of that. And you have to be willing to do the, t spend the time, you know, doing that um, when you are in leadership so that it could trickle down you know, to those who are your directors or your managers, you know, so that they feel like, okay, we can bring this to this conversation and then we're going to see some change actually occur. That's awesome because uh, you sort of done already the hard work of communicating the benefits and the value of this. So the only thing people need to do is just forward uh, the HBR yeah. article to, their, to yeah. their <laughs> like read this. That's why I'm here. <laughs> Sometimes it works. So um, yeah. Also another resource that we'll definitely link uh, in the show notes. Um, one other question I had around this is um, what is the question that you feel people should be asking more often? Which, what is the question mm. that people aren't asking enough related to this topic? I think the the question people aren't asking, are we delivering good design? Um, you know, and really when you look that up, that is a term. It was developed by someone. Are you following good design uh, in that way? And then you can step back and look and say, yes, we are. Or we haven't been or we're missing the market times or we're not consistent. You know, and, and then start to figure out the principles, practices, methodology that I think are going to lead you to good design. Uh, I, th I think that's what people have to ask themselves. And then they'll figure out from there, like, OK, we don't have inclusivity. We're not delivering work that's really representative of what our client is asking us to do. Um, internally, we need to make some changes. You know, I think those are the things that have to be done. But I think just that simple stepping back and, and asking that word, you know, that phrase. That's uh, that's super powerful, and I really love it. Like, uh, th there are so many ways people evaluate how their organization is performing, but I don't think a lot of organizations ask themselves, "Are we delivering good design?" Some some out there will, and we'll okay. be able to recognize those organizations. But I think right. most companies don't, and. Uh, developing that awareness that there is such a thing as good design, developing the vocabulary to define what is good design to us, and and then how do we evaluate it? It's uh, it, it could be a very powerful uh, sort of uh, conversation starter. 
Yeah, I agree. I, I, and and I'm like you, I, I would, that's probably a poll mark for you to take. How many people are asking them, themselves, are they bringing about good design? You know, it maybe independent houses probably do it more than anything, you know, but like you said, bigger companies, I would be surprised. And I would really love to know that, you know, are you stepping back in your team? And it comes from the top. It's not just your design team you know, asking that. It comes from the top and leadership perspective. Are you delivering good design? Mm. And then having standards around that, good Correct. design standards, like what is your Correct. what is your benchmark? Like, uh, yeah. that's super interesting. That is that is a question that should be asked more often. I thank yeah. you again. Thank you for bringing that up. No, super powerful. no, 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 this is great. Absolutely. Uh, um, <laughs> I'm curious uh, if you if you sort of follow the trajectory of how this movement is developing, how the awareness around this topic is developing. Where do we hope we'll be in, let's say, three years? Woo. Um, I think we'll still be having a conversation. So I'm going to say that, and it's not about pe pessimism. I just think we'll still, and I think because we need to continue to have the conversation. And it goes back to your the quote about the crisis, because that is just human nature that things will arise. So I think that we have to continue to have, so hopefully we'll be past this hump and we won't be still having a conversation about things that have impacted from 2020, 21. You know, we have, we'll have used design in a way to kind of help solve that and move into more of a place of delivering good design. But I think if we learn the lessons from 2021, because again, this was global, this impacted everyone. Um, and that has not often happened. You know, certain locations have been impacted, like the U.S. has had a crisis or, you know, another country has had a crisis. But particularly everyone having this crisis, there's a lot to learn from 20 and 21. And so I think that if we're having conversations like we learned this and this is how we'll be more prepared to be able to deal with this if it happens again, than saying, oh, wow, we didn't learn anything from it. We, we, we walked away from it, glad we walked away from it, and that was it. And we have no practice in place. Then I think that we, again, I think that's just failure. I, I hope people will learn something. I do something. too. <laughs> I do too. But, we uh, need it. We need it. We, we, we must. <laughs> well, speaking about learnings and lessons, um, what is the thing that you maybe wish you had known five years ago about this topic? Um, I think I, I think the tools being available to me is probably what would have been good for me. Um, I, I think five years ago I was learning them, you know, learning this. Um, I think the tools would have been great to be able to move very small organizations forward faster. Um, that probably would have been good for me to be able to do, to be able to have a, a better blueprint um, when we talk about good design to really have a better blueprint that I could have given to very small organizations to, uh, to enable them to be able to be in a mode that when a crisis hit them, they would have been able to, uh, probably thrive a little more or even survive a little more. Both words could be used and not completely collapse, you know? Um, in that in that light, so that that thing that's what would have been good for me five years ago. Mm. Yeah. But I would say that, that maybe most of those tools weren't yet available back then, and, yeah. and yeah. they're coming uh, right now. I think people are yeah. very actively developing these tools, these frameworks, mm -hmm. um, giving us shoulders to stand upon. Um, yeah, that's a good way to put it. <laughs> so we we covered a lot of ground in. Uh, in this conversation, uh, we went through your journey of how you got uh, interested in design for inclusivity, getting designers at the table from the very start, making sure that community, that the voice, not just the voice of the community, that the community mm -hmm. is uh, represented in the design process, design justice. We talked about good design. I'm curious, how would you summarize uh, the last, I don't know, 40 minutes? <laughs> This is, let, let me say, this has been one of the uh, most insightful conversations because normally the conversations are very targeted to one thing, but I think that this is a, a more broader conversation I've had about design as a whole. Um, it's been amazing, really. It excites me, inspires me to go on through my day um, to really focus on 
what it means to be inclusive in design and really good design. I think that the, it really is like good design and inclusive. You know what I'm saying? If you think about hierarchy, if you do that, then you'll deliver this. And I think that's what I've gotten most out of this conversation. If my head continues to be on good design, then I'll continue to deliver inclusive design. Mm, I like that. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. definitely. And um, if somebody made it all the way uh, till this point in the conversation, what do you hope is the one thing that, uh, what is the one thing you at least hope that they will walk away with and remember maybe? Yeah, that, you know, I think the biggest thing to remember is um, continue to strive towards being a good designer. You know, continue to fight for your place wherever you are. Um, because even if I'm not there, I'm still championing you <laughs> as a designer to have your place within the organization and your voice be heard. A designer's voices have to be heard. That's what I do believe. Mm. So. Yeah. And, and, uh, keep on, like you said, uh, making yourself hurt. And it's an, yes. uh, it's an, on, it's just part of the work and, uh, it, it will be for a very long time and don't get very discouraged true. and yep. find, find others who are doing that as well, because it gets yeah. easier when you see that, uh, more people are sort of, I wouldn't, I wouldn't describe it as a struggle, but, uh, it's definitely, uh, it can be challenging sometimes. Oh, very much so. Yeah. So I think the, the, the sum it up to is just find community, you know, a community of designer, whether it's in your professional or you turn around and have to go outside in order to find it, because this will ensure that you continue to go back into that space and you're able to, you know, have a voice. Yeah. Awesome. It was a great conversation, Karen. Uh, I hope, uh, like with many of the recent topics that we'll be able to address this more often, I think we're not done. We're sort of just getting started on this journey and a lot of things will, uh, will sort of develop. So, um, thank you for addressing this and inspiring. Yeah, and thank you. you for sharing a lot of the resources. I'll make sure to add everything in the, in the show notes so people can uh, continue digging in, uh, into this. Thank you, Mark. This has been great. I appreciate it. I really hope that you enjoyed this conversation with Karen. And if you did, take a moment to leave a short comment down below with your highlight. My name is Mark Fontaine, and I want to thank you for being part of the service design community. Thanks so much for watching, and I look forward to see you in the next video.